Greetings, Audio Avengers! Welcome to the Marvelous TV Club, a podcast tackling our collective obsession with the latest releases from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And that means we're discussing the finale of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, titled One World, One People. Every week, we analyze the newest chapter of the MCU from three angles you will only find on this podcast. Our story cast is live, and Amanda and Maeve explore the finale's vocal debate between patriotism and nationalism. And they discuss its use of the genre of the fable to interrogate what it means to be a just democracy. Also, we get way into the costumes. On Wednesday's PonderVision, Jesse Taylor and I are going to dive into our speculation about why John Walker was changing clothes in the Senate chamber and what the newly announced Captain America 4 movie should be about and so much more. But now it is time for this show, our character cast. Here, we explore episodes of Marvel TV through the lenses of the characters themselves. And as with any finale, this was an episode full of resolutions. What did they absolutely nail? What doesn't sit right with us? We're going to get into all of that. I am your host, Mark Folletti, and to help me understand these characters better is someone whose day job is to be an actual defender of the Constitution, Christine Kippens. Hi, Christine. Hello, hello. So we've had like four straight months of Marvel TV. Is it going to be weird to take like a six week break for Loki? It is. But I feel like it's also a great time to rewatch all the Thor movies Mm. and get reacquainted with Loki. But yeah, I mean, I feel like we could probably use a little bit of a break, but I'm always greedy for Marvel. So I'll probably spend one week off. And then the very next week be like, all right, I need Loki directly injected into my veins. Where is it? I can't wait another five weeks. This is ridiculous. I want it now. I definitely am ready for a bit of a break. Now, for folks who are listening to this podcast, please know we are going to keep doing some cool stuff for you. We've got some interviews lined up. We're going to have our first epic crossover event, kind of looking back at the MCU to this point. So a lot of content is coming, but we're going to do more like once a week as opposed to three times a week while we're in this break period. And then we're going to fire back up for Loki and have a great time. But I do think it's good for everyone to get a little bit of a taste of what it's like to not have Marvel a bit. So we get a little hungrier for it. And we're super excited for Loki. Plus, you know, everyone's getting their vaccines and they need a few weeks to get outside and have fun, maybe party a little. Listen, I'm ready to get my hot girl summer on. I need my second shot ASAP. We should all be like Bushwick, uh, where Maeve That's lives. That's right. Hear, hear the fun and story cast. Um, hardy, hardy, just get vaccinated first, but still wear your goddamn mask, folks. Always, always take precautions. Now, our big seven characters that we talked about from episode five last week on this show are, unsurprisingly, the big seven characters for the finale. So we're going to talk about Sam, Isaiah, Bucky, Walker, Sharon, Carly, and Zemo. But we have to begin with Captain America, Sam Wilson. Aww. IO9's review said, and I quote, Sam Wilson has officially picked up the mantle of Captain America, and though the decision should be momentous, it just sort of happens. The action quickly kicks in, leaving the big reveal on the wayside. End quote. Christine, is that how you felt when Sam Wilson flew in at the beginning of the episode? I hate to say it, but it is. And I feel like... This might be this might be where the fact that this was a TV show and not a movie kind of screwed the moment because if we, we had just moved from Sam opening the case to, you know, the big reveal a few minutes later, then I feel like the momentum of episode 5 and all of that emotion would have lent itself to greater impact when the um when the uniform is revealed. Mm -hmm. But for me, I mean, with this, it was done at night. We can't see him flying in. All we see is the light from his jetpack. And then once he gets to the GRC building, he quickly shoots out the shield, right? And there's like a brief second where we see the full extent of the wings and the shield is in view. But you literally have to pause your television to see it. (laughs) And then he has to bust through the glass. And once he's inside and you get the uniform, the lighting is just terrible. It's absolutely terrible. It's not a good moment for the suit. And, uh, And my final gripe is I don't like the suit. Okay. Yeah, we should definitely talk about that. We should definitely get into like whether the suit is good. 
I feel like we did spend all of episode five wrestling with whether the mantle was something he wanted to take up. But it is a weird factor of the the combination of going weekly for a show that is going to ultimately be streaming that they have these tension points of how to create, uh, well, tension, I guess. Because mm-hmm. if you're going to go back and stream this show from start to finish, like every single person who has not already watched it will now do, I think that moment might potentially land really well. But for those of us who had to wait a week, I can see how his arrival might have felt like a weird letdown, especially because they maybe went too hard into this realism of lighting, which they've done off and on in this show. Sometimes they do hyper cinematic lighting. Like I think about Walker when he's kneeling down inside that warehouse before Bucky and Sam show up. Mm -hmm. Other times they go for much more of like a cinema veritas kind of action lighting. And they did that here. And I certainly take your point. For me, all I can say is that when he broke through that window, I was just like, woohoo. And I really (laughs) liked it because I, I... I felt he had worked through his questions last episode, and I just wanted to see his decision because there was a very real chance he would have landed as Falcon with the shield or some other option. Right. And to see him step forward in the uniform was a big deal for me. But let's talk about that uniform. What did you think? It sounds like you are pretty off board. Yeah. I mean, for one thing, I, I do want to pick up on something you just said. Like, I I don't want to minimize the symbolism of him having to like break through the glass before his big reveal, right? Like I believe that they did that for a symbolic reason and I don't want to minimize that at all. But yeah, I just, oh, I don't like the white of the suit. And listen, I understand it might strike a chord with the comic book folks since I believe it's taken from the comic book look and I get that nostalgic connection, but I don't have that, right? Like I never read any of these comic books. So I just have to go on the fashion. And for me, the fashion is dreadful. (laughs) It's dreadful. Like particularly the way his goggles are done with the white, it just Mm -hmm. looks so bulky. And white usually looks really good against darker skin, right? Like, it just makes everything pop. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to take that away from Sam either. But there's just something about this look that it just, it looks like a superhero uniform. And here's the thing, like, I I don't like that. It feels comical to a sense. Like, it's so overdone. It kind of feels like... Steve's original uniform, you know, and like eventually over time it gets toned down and it's more like practical, but still unique. So like, you know that that's Captain America with this. It's just like too flashy. And I don't know. I'm I'm just not into it. My gut says this is poor fashions. It's absolutely dreadful. I'm on a couch with Leon Talley being like, Mm-mm, boo-boo, <laughs> send that back to the designer. We need to talk to Shuri. Like, this is just not working for me. Steve's outfit is a really interesting comp for this because I have always thought, or had always thought, Captain America's outfit was not something you could easily replicate in a movie. But then I saw First Avenger, and I thought, wow, they really nailed it. The helmet looks cool. It's sort Mm -hmm. of military, but still has the Captain America feel. Then, yeah, Avengers took a huge step back. Joss Whedon tried to create some kind of retro nostalgia vibe for him. I think he Mm -hmm. wanted a little bit of that, like Batman from the 60s kind of feel to it. And it was just awful. And that took me out of Avengers the first time I saw it to the point where people had to tell me to stop complaining when we were walking out of the movie. (laughs) But yeah, Winter Soldier then went back to a blend of the two that really, really was probably still for me my favorite Captain America outfit. And this just might be one of those where they wanted, they had a vision for something that didn't work. I loved what we talked about on StoryCast and the difference between Sam's headgear and John's headgear conceptually, but that does Mm -hmm. no bearing on whether or not the fashion choice is good. And I confess, when I watched, all I could think was, one, it would be weird and hard to turn your head in this, which is not good for someone who's flying really fast. Right. Two, his ears sometimes looked like they were getting pulled down and doing strange stuff. And I focused on, you know, the ears of John Walker at the end of uh, episode one when he was revealed. And there's just something about how they want these exposed ears in these costumes that maybe it's easier for the actors to hear. It might be a whole hell of a lot easier to act when those ears are out. 
But the way they're doing it in the costumes just doesn't feel right. When they had Sam at the end, you know, doing his his big speech to the GRC folks, I just kept looking at his ears because they stood out so much. And all I kept thinking was, Sam's going to get a fucking ear infection flying around with these exposed ears. Like, it's just like having all that wind in his ear is not going to be good. So even from like a practical standpoint, it was just gnawing at me. Like, why are his ears out? This is bad. Like, Frostbite is real. When you're outside and flying around in the sky, frostbite is real. <laughs> I know it's true, but I'm like, even with the Wakanda tech, when um, T'Challa's face mask could basically appear and disappear, why not have like some ear flaps for <laughs> for Sam to make sure he doesn't get a freaking ear infection when he flies from the freaking bayou up to New York City? Well, let's hope they take some time to revise and update and upgrade before the big movie, which I'm excited to talk a little bit more about. But... Enough about the costume for now. I feel like there's there's hope for the future, but this was it. That was a TV feeling costume on a show that otherwise I think did a pretty good job of mm. giving us a movie vibe. Um, mm-hmm. Though again, I know that's even up for debate. But anyway, I want to talk about Anthony Mackie's performance a little bit too in the context of this finale because I recall that a lot of people were were skeptical of Chris Evans when he was named Captain America before First Avenger. I certainly was on that camp. I did not love his Johnny Storm. I thought that was not an impressive movie, nor was he impressive in it. Turns out that was Fantastic Four's fault and is actually a goddamn travesty in retrospect, given how good Chris Evans turned out to be. He was amazing. And I think a lot of people were skeptical of Anthony Mackie coming into this and Falcon as a character because he was kind of an underdeveloped sidekick. At the end of the series, we've seen it all now. How do you feel about Anthony Mackie's performance? And did he deliver a Captain America that we can get behind? Listen, Anthony Mackie has been in a lot of movies. I mean, I haven't seen any of them. Except (laughs) Million Dollar Baby, uh, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, and a random episode of Black Mirror that's really, really good. If you have not seen the Striking Vipers episode, I highly suggest that you watch it. So he's got the chops. Like, he's a good actor. Like We know he can do comedy. But I think he's proved with this show that he could carry serious scenes as well. Yeah. That speech to the GRC members was basically a monologue. I thought he did a really good job with it. And every scene he did with Carl Lumbly was perfection. Perfection. So I hope he shuts the critics up and gets way more work after this TV show. He's a big deal. I think he's just getting started. Yeah, for me, he had gravitas. He had humor. He delivered that optimism. But the quality I really connected with was his intimacy, which is maybe one of the ways I would describe what you're talking Mm -hmm. about in those Carl Lumbly scenes. You could feel his closeness with Sarah, even though they had limited time together after that first episode, right? Definitely, you could feel it with Bucky. I think about even just those warm shots of them at the end, you know, him looking back over his shoulder. There was a lot of touching of the shoulder language in this entire show, right? We, mm-hmm. We've talked about the slap on the shoulder when he's leaving the therapy conversation inside of the building with Bucky and saying basically they'll never talk at the end of this. And by the final shot of them together are these like gentle touches to the shoulder. And we've talked about Sebastian Stan's physical acting. Well, Mm -hmm. I think Mackie delivered a lot of that with that kind of language of those touches. But he even was able to draw Carly close. We we felt a connection even as those two were fighting for their lives. So I thought the performance was really strong. What about his Captain America? You mentioned the monologue. I I guess what I would say is I appreciated that his Captain America is using de-escalation and nonviolence to solve problems Mm -hmm. first, you know? Mm -hmm. So on some of the shows on Marvelous TV Club, we've talked about whether Sam's background as a counselor was kind of was forgotten. Instead, I think it's now maybe the most unique aspect of his heroing. And the finale showed that that is what is at the heart of his version of Captain America. So I really dig that. Yeah, like I remember... (laughs) I remember at the beginning of our Falcon and Winter Soldier analysis, you talking about how Sam talks a lot. (laughs) (laughs) That's his strength, right? Is his talking. I mean, just to marry this with our 
previous conversation on Mackie's acting, just the way he said Carly's name while they were fighting was so important because it conveyed all of his empathy and understanding and trying to reach her by talking to her about it and not resorting to violence and trying to de-escalate things. So particularly at a time where de-escalation is at the forefront of conversations regarding how we police in this country, I think having a Captain America who centers that type of behavior when policing, and listen, that's what the Avengers do. They're a fucking global police force. (laughs) I think that's incredibly important. It's a message that we need to be emphasizing right now because it will literally save lives. And maybe we just gave the answer to this question then, but what is fundamentally different about Steve's cap and Sam's cap, if anything? So let's start with the obvious. Sam flies and Steve never did. That's that's a fact. (laughs) So one of our loyal listeners, a young man named Miles, got in touch with me. Mm. And he has named the flying incarnation of Captain America, Bald Eagle. So (laughs) shout out to Miles and Leo and Nando out in Brooklyn. Thanks so much for listening and sharing your great ideas with us. Another difference between Sam and Steve is that, and this one's a little obvious, Sam's not afraid to use strong language. True. I mean, he said shit during his (laughs) on-camera debut (laughs) as Captain America, which cracked me up. But the two big ones, the first is something that we've discussed, I think, several times during StoryCast, and that's... Sam still has faith in institutions and governments. You know, he pleads with the GRC to do the right thing. He recommits to Sharon that he's going to get her that part in. And he has faith in the U.S. government not forgetting about what it did to Isaiah Bradley now that his story is part of the Captain America Museum. Right. But Steve believed more in himself and the team around him. You know, that seed kind of sprouted in Winter Soldier until it exploded in Civil War. And again, it's wild to think about considering they were both on the same side, right? But that's still like a difference between those two characters. And finally, I'm not sure Steve, or at least MCU Steve, never really had to contemplate the weight of the title and the uniform, you know, what it means to be Captain America. At least from my perspective, Steve just carried on doing what he thought was right. Unlike Walker and Sam, he never introduced himself as Captain America, at least not to my recollection, right? Like he was always Steve Rogers. He had the privilege of moving through life without having to worry about what it meant to be Captain America because he created that persona by simply being who he was. He was a World War II hero. No one questioned his loyalty or his motives or his right to be a representation of America. Sam, on the other hand, every move he makes will be scrutinized and analyzed for its American worthiness simply because he's a black man. Like, can you imagine the Tucker Carlson segment on the night Sam showed up in New York with that Captain America uniform? Kill me now. He His head would explode. <laughs> his head would straight up explode. What's the deal? Oh, my God. It would just be the worst thing ever. Now that's in my head and I can't get it out. Thanks a lot for that Sorry. one, Christine. Sorry. No, and I just want to say again, we've never seen a Marvel hero hold ground and refuse to escalate. The fact that it's also one of the most vulnerable non-super superheroes who could die in the line of work. I don't know. It's pretty inspiring. I hope every law enforcement officer in America is taking some goddamn notes. Mm -hmm. So Sam likes to talk. Fact established. (laughs) He spent a lot of this episode making moral and philosophical arguments. Was there an idea of his that you most strongly agreed with or especially felt was poignant and meaningful? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely a few, but the, the one that most struck a chord with me is that the people who are closest to the pain need to be closest to the power. When decisions are being made, it is critical that those who are impacted be a part of the decision-making. 
They need to have a voice. This is something that I am very passionate about. I see it happen all the time when big pieces of legislation get introduced and the people most vocal about it are just well-known organizations and not the ones that represent the people most impacted. And when you do talk to those folks about the bill, they're like, we don't see ourselves here. (laughs) So he was right to call out the GRC folks on the fact that displaced people weren't a part of the conversation when they drafted the Patch Act. I saw a lot of progressives talking about how on the nose Sam's speech was and how obvious it was and essentially that they were taking it for granted. And I get that. I respect everybody's opinion, however they feel about this show or any show here at the Marvelous TV Club. We're not here to tell you how to feel. Right. But I actually think we might fail to grasp, we, the sort of general collective progressive on Twitter a lot crowd, we might fail to grasp how many well-meaning people can easily buy into frames like, quote unquote, terrorist. Talking about Fox News and Tucker Carlson, they spend all day and night trying to turn every person migrating or applying for refugee status into one, right? And the polling shows that shit trickles into mainstream society. Mm -hmm. Sam is taking the time not just to shout it down, to, to denounce it, to declare it unjust. He's making a detailed and passionate argument against it. And that's the kind of shit that can change people's minds. And so I love that he steps forward and makes the case for rethinking why somebody is taking what people perceive as terrorist actions and trying to humanize that as much as possible. If we put that in the context of something like Israel and Palestine, you know, a lot of really interesting conversation can start from the place that Sam begins. Yeah, I mean, words fucking matter, folks. You know, calling people terrorists, refugees and thugs carry a lot of weight. Add rioters to the list. Yes. Right? Yes. You know, because it paints people in a certain light and erases any nuance they might have for the reasons behind their actions. And then it also helps make more palatable any actions taken against them. Like the GRC, you know, they're framed as having peacekeepers with guns. (laughs) Like Walker was a quote unquote peacekeeper. I don't know what kind of peace he was keeping in that square, but he's a peacekeeper. And that sounds far more palatable than executioner. Yeah, yeah. no, that's right. That's right. Were there any ideas that Sam espoused that you were kind of skeptical of or disagreed with? I mean, he didn't necessarily espouse it. You know, he didn't um, formally make some type of speech about it. But I'm not sure I agree with him being prepared to sacrifice his life for Curly's redemption. Hmm. What do you mean? Like, uh, listen, I agree with Brother Martin, right? Peaceful means is always the starting point. But sometimes you need to bring a little bit of fire (laughs) to protect yourself. Listen, Curly needed to vent, you know, understatement of the fucking year. (laughs) And Sam could take a wailing until she's exhausted to the point of where she doesn't have the energy to do anything but but listen to him and to what he has to say. But once a gun is involved, fucking forget about it. To me, that seemed like a wasteful hero moment for Sam. The best interpretation of that I would have is he recognized that it was an inflection point, not just for Carly specifically, but for the entire movement. Mm-hmm. By putting himself in that situation, he was taking a huge risk that Carly would pause and rethink. And honestly, I think the show suggests he might have miscalculated the amount of empathy or overlap that she would have for what he thinks. So Sharon shoots her dead. And I don't know what to take away from that. But it is interesting that Sam was willing to go all the way with Carly. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. All the way. Like, She was applying pressure to that trigger to end his life. And he didn't even try to put those vibranium wings in front of his face. That's some bravery, maybe not wisdom, but bravery. Well, let's talk about Isaiah Bradley. So there was a popular Twitter conversation on Friday about how happy it made people to see Isaiah Bradley get public recognition inside the big Captain America exhibit at the Smithsonian. And I, I think we can both appreciate that, though I do not want to yep. speak for you. 
But you had an amazing reply to that thread. Can you talk about your reaction to that scene? Yeah, so shout out to the Twitter account Spidey News. You know, they posted a clip of Sam, Isaiah, and Eli in the Bradley wing of the Captain America Museum. And they rightly noted the importance of that scene. You know, how impactful it was to see a black man get credit for his service, especially when that service is rooted in mistreatment and dehumanization. And I agreed with that commentary. You know, the only thing I added was that I wish Sam had gotten Isaiah's permission before sharing Isaiah's story with the museum curator and then encouraging them to create this new wing, which honestly should be much bigger than that fucking broom closet it's in and should be about Isaiah and all of his brothers who were tortured and died under that secret super soldier program in the 50s but i have a huge problem with sam here this is specifically what i said during last week's podcast episode i didn't want for sam right i didn't want him to share isaiah's story with anyone without isaiah's permission because it's such a betrayal of trust and it's so much worse Because Isaiah's story is one where he's treated as less than human, his feelings, thoughts, and life didn't matter. Like, all of his autonomy was stripped of him. The government didn't ask his permission to experiment on his body. The government didn't ask his permission to give him the secret soldier serum. For Sam to then go and share Isaiah's story with the world like that after Isaiah specifically told him not to for fear of his own life. He's lucky that Isaiah didn't clock him in the museum. Yeah, it's as risky as the Carly decision just for somebody else, not for him, for Isaiah. Yeah, it's it's a mess. Listen, storytelling is incredibly personal and labor intensive. And sometimes there's backlash. So I share my abortion story through the We Testify organization as a means to bust stigma around having abortions. And I'll be damned if someone decides to share my abortion story without my say-so. Like, I'm very thoughtful about what part of my story I'm going to share and with which audience and at what time is appropriate for me. The only person who has the right to share your story is you. And that means being able to delegate the telling to someone else. Right. You know, but you have to make that decision, not someone else, even if they're well-meaning. In my work at Rewire News Group, we deal a lot with stories of sexual trauma and assault and abortion, things exactly like what you're talking about. And something we always strive to center is that you can't tell someone else's story without their consent. And you have to strive not to tell it in somebody else's words. And not only... Did Isaiah not know about this? Someone else put it to words for mass consumption. Mm -hmm. Here's an example. As I want to do, I paused the episode and looked closely at the Isaiah Bradley plaque. Now, I have a feeling you're not going to love this either. Here's what it said about his imprisonment. Oh, my God. Let me prepare myself. Yeah. Because I I didn't listen to new rock stars or anything because they usually do the zoom and enhance stuff, too. So here we go. (sighs) And I'm quoting here, some individuals within the government tried to erase Isaiah's story from history. That is not fair. That is not accurate. It was the government. It was the system. Putting it on a few rogues is the same shit as saying there's only a few bad cops out there. That's not how Isaiah would talk about this. He would not have said some individuals within the government tried to erase. First of all, they successfully erased. And this one three paragraph plaque does not solve that problem. And two, it was utterly systemic. And he was clear about that to Sam. And this is this is not accountability. This is not saying we fucked up. Here's who did it and why. And we'll never do something like this again. <laughs> right. Because this is horrendous. here's a formal that- apology like we just made Joe Biden just made you know, for not acknowledging the Armenian genocide, whatever, right? You, right. Have to, you have to put the sins on the table, not attribute them to some individuals. Some individuals 
we're not refusing to acknowledge the Armenian <laughs> genocide, right? Some like no, the entire U.S. government since the Armenian genocide has refused to. Yeah, so same thing here, right? There were thirty years of individuals at every level of <sighs> government who could have done something about this and didn't. That's so frustrating. Yeah, I don't love it. Yeah, no, I hate it. I actually think there was an easy solution to this in the story, too. Yes. What I wish would happen was just at the end when he meets up with Isaiah, mm -hmm. that he goes to him and talks to him, doesn't pressure him, but, uh, you know, talks to him about whether Isaiah is ready to tell his story. And Isaiah makes that call for himself. Right. That would have been great. And then we don't need to see the exhibit because no matter what they show us, to your point, it's never going to be enough. So let's just hear about them make, deciding to make the first move. I had the exact same reaction, Mark. Like that conversation that they're having in Isaiah's beautiful garden, his little utopian in his backyard, was the perfect time for Sam to be like, listen, I couldn't have done this without you. I wouldn't have done this without you and knowing your story. And like, I, I am not, I'm not a writer of Folletti Peace Theater. I would leave that to you. But I'm sure that there's a way that Sam could have been like, listen, we're part of the same story now. Let's tell it. Let's tell it together. We need to make sure that folks know about you and the fact that you were a super soldier for America and you had amazing contributions and you were a hero and you did the same thing Steve Rogers did, but they completely erased your history. And we need to shed light on the fact that this country has created atrocities upon you and upon your brethren that they need to answer for. And I am going to be a representation of the pain that you have suffered and your brethren have suffered and so many have suffered. And I'm going to take us to the next step. But let's tell this story together. And he and he could have like had his tears down and they could have had that embrace that they had in the museum. And that would have been enough. You know, and then maybe next season we have another conversation at the museum where we see this new expanded wing about the black you know, super soldier experiment and centering Isaiah and having that beautiful statue of him and telling his story and telling the story of all of his brothers who died with him. It would have been just as powerful and Isaiah would have maintained his autonomy. Yeah, I think it would have been even more powerful because we can imagine what they're going to build together. We don't have to see this somewhat disappointing version because they obviously deserve to have their own exhibit, right? It would be like putting the Tuskegee experiment stuff inside of a wing about like medical advancements. Oh, right. by the way, here's a corner where this terrible thing happened. They, it's I understand what they were going for. I'm not trying to be overly harsh, but it would have created in the audience a chance to imagine the better version of this. And that would have been so beautiful. Yeah. So, so to that point, I want to mention that a few of our listeners engaged with me on Twitter regarding this point. And Ms. K. Cabrera said that she viewed the exhibit as only having the story of his service and rescuing his crew, not of the serum, which she took as the thing to keep private. Did you have a similar take? My assumption was that it was the whole story, especially because it addressed his imprisonment. But I don't remember whether or not they addressed the serum on that plaque. I can't decide if that would make it better or worse. What do you think about that? Would that have is this a, would it have been better or worse to do it this way if they did it this way? I mean, it's unclear whether the fact that the government experimented on him and locked him away for decades is part of the exhibit. But considering he's part of the Steve Rogers or Captain America Museum or whatever this thing is, or maybe it's just an exhibit in a larger theme Smithsonian. I'm assuming they have to say that Isaiah was a super soldier if he's mixed in with Steve. Yeah, exactly. I think because I know they mentioned other soldiers and that there were experiments and that most people died and that there was a mission into Korea. All of that is on the plaque. I remember. Oh, okay. I just don't remember if they say super soldier serum, but I feel like they have to because what else would they be experimenting on people on? Right, right. Like how else? How else is there a connection to Steve? Like the nexus right. is the serum. Right. Um, 
And also, KD Fried mentioned that they believe the exhibit didn't reveal that Isaiah was still alive. I also believe that. Okay, because I hadn't thought about that and just wanted to lift up idea- that idea. Do you think that changes anything about Sam's choice? <laughs> well, I can understand why he wouldn't walk Isaiah into a room with the Smithsonian planners to say, here's this guy who's been off the books for over, you know, 20 years, probably. We'd like to build this exhibit together. But I don't think it absolves him of not getting Isaiah's version of the story so that however he needs to bring it to people to protect Isaiah's life is rooted in that authenticity. Yeah, I agree. On a hopeful note, the only way we're going to tell these stories in these monoculture vehicles like superheroes is to try, make some mistakes, try again, get better. So if I'm trying to be generous here, I think the interpretation of what they were going for with Isaiah's story is that his reluctance to step forward was due to a deep cynicism that Sam broke through by stepping forward and doing what Isaiah thought was impossible Does that resonate with you at all? I mean, it does to a certain extent. Listen, they're both products of the time they're in, Mm -hmm. right? Folks thought that Captain America is a title given to whomever, you know, by the U.S. government, (laughs) right? Like (laughs) one guy was like, when did the U.S. government make you Captain America? So I feel like Isaiah is right to think that the government would never make a black man Captain America when he basically did the job back in the 50s. And rather than show him off to the world as Captain America, they locked him away for decades. That man is traumatized and has earned his distrust of the U.S. government. Not to mention, he's not deaf and blind, right? Like, he's well aware that not much has changed since then. People want to talk about all the progress that has been made, but the government is still killing black people. They're still getting away with it. That Chauvin trial didn't mean shit, folks. Cops killed a 16-year-old black girl the same day those guilty verdicts came down. They're still making it difficult as hell for black folks to vote, to earn a living, to own a home, to run a business, to get an education. Look around. Isaiah is not wrong. And Sam is aware of all of this. He's not moving forward in ignorance, right? Like, I mean, we had that whole scene with him and his sister trying to get a small business loan. But I'm not sure Sam broke through that cynicism so much as acknowledged it in himself and found a way to sidestep it. So after four and a half episodes (laughs) of rejecting the shield and the title, He didn't wait for the government to be like, Walker was garbage. Would you please be our Captain America? (laughs) We want you back, right? (laughs) We want you back. We fucked up. Sorry. No, he he took that title. He took that bloody shield from Walker, put it on his back and didn't ask anyone for permission again. This time, I agree with the move not to ask for permission. (laughs) And I think he knew the world needed Captain America. He knew that the government is shitty at choosing one. And he finally realized that he's the man for the job. Honestly, the only man for the job. Is the government shitty at doing this? Or are some individuals in the government shitty at choosing (laughs) Captain America, Christine? I can't tell the difference. No, I'm just kidding. Look, this was an amazing journey with Isaiah. And I'm really, you know, proud of the show for taking this journey. I understand... All, folks of all different reactions of how satisfied or unsatisfied they are with how much screen time it got, wh- how it resolved. But has his story changed anything about the way you think of the mantle of Captain America, Isaiah Bradley's story? Yeah, I think Sam becoming Captain America without first hearing Isaiah's story would have been too easy, too simplistic, and too fanciful. And I don't mean for Sam, I mean for us as the viewers. Yeah, yeah, agreed. The the torture and erasure of Isaiah Bradley made this story more believable for me because of how similar Isaiah's story is to actual events of the past, you know, minus the super soldier serum. And and we've discussed those historical points in previous episodes of both character cast and story cast, and I think Ponder Vision too. So if Captain America is meant to represent America. They have to represent all of America. 
that means they need to represent the white people, the indigenous people, the black people, the other people of color, men, women, non-binary folks, gay, straight, bi, citizen, immigrant, disabled, everybody. Everybody. And they have to represent America's past and present. The bits that make us a city on a hill and the bits that make us the gravest sinners on the planet. Steve wasn't doing any of that. No. No one looked at Steve Rogers and thought about the impact of the transatlantic slave trade on modern American society. No one looked at Steve Rogers and thought, America has a fucked up past. And <laughs> what are they doing about it now? No, you they know? just, you know, they, they just saw the shining beacon of nostalgia combined with pride, maybe. And, and those things can be real dangerous when you put them in the right cocktail and don't have a look at the past involved. 100%. And, you know, we we started out this podcast six or seven weeks ago trying to figure out how Sam is going to carry on Steve's legacy. And now it's about carrying on Isaiah's as well as Steve's. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Steve Rogers, Captain America, stood on the invisible and erased suffering of Black Americans, Isaiah Bradley, and every other one of those folks who was experimented on. What I think the show made clear is that we cannot settle for a cap that is only not making that problem worse, which I think mm -hmm. is where Steve was at, mm -hmm. but that we need one that forces people to reckon with it. And yes. that's pretty radical inside the confines of the MCU. Again, it's not solving our actual real world problems, but I, I found that to be a pretty transformative way to think about Captain America, which is very much what you were saying. And I just, I think that's really cool. No, I love that. Are you ready to talk about Bucky? I am always ready to talk about my boo-boo Bucky. You know that. <laughs> I was surprised at the end credits of the show. And here's why. We got the awesome transformation. It was not Falcon and the Winter Soldier. The show's you know, credits were Captain America and the Winter Soldier at the mm -hmm. end. But they weren't Captain America and Bucky. They weren't Captain America and the White Wolf. It was Captain America and the Winter Soldier. Is Bucky still the Winter Soldier? Yes, folks. Yes, he okay. is. Okay. Listen, he has made a lot of progress. And hopefully my boo-boo Bucky is sleeping well at night. And those nightmares are a thing of the past because Sarah is holding on to him tight. And he feels content. And, you know, he's done all the work that he needed to do. But even though he didn't have any control over his actions while he was the Winter Soldier, he still has that muscle memory. Yes. I mean, he turned it back on really quickly and convincingly in Madripoor. Let's not forget that. <laughs> and let's also not forget the first time we see Bucky in action, he just wanted to jump the Flag Smashers, right? So, like, in a pinch, Bucky will choose violence. Yeah. So I think he will always carry a bit of the Winter Soldier in him because none of us can escape our past. Even the bits that were out of our control. But I would love for season two to be called Captain America and the White Wolf, like at the very end, like a very similar transformation. You know, it doesn't have the same ring to it, but I kind of like the idea of a black Captain America and his white sidekick whose name originated in Wakanda. Like mix all that shit up. I love it. That's great. You're right, actually. Bucky is only probably at the start of truly understanding what it means to separate himself from the Winter Soldier persona. He has stopped avenging, but he is only just starting that amending process. Because people might say, hey, he puts that book aside. That means he's done. But the book, which Sam talked to him about, was not the right way to go about this. Yeah. And unlike Sam's journey, Sam lands at a destination as Captain America. Bucky isn't sure where he's going yet. So Yori felt like the beginning of a process, but not the end and I feel excited for what they're going to do with him. But I agree. You're right. He He's actually at the start of a process where Sam is at the end of the process. And the show was about Sam's journey. Bucky's journey was part of that. But the show was not about him, them both taking equal size journeys. The show was about Sam's transformation to Captain America. Bucky is a part of that story. Right. I'm going to put on my overthinking cap now. You ready? You mean you haven't you haven't had it on all episode long? I Come only on, have Mark. it on. No. Okay, <laughs> let me grab a second overthinking cap and put it over the first one. 
Uh, because like Sam, my exposed head could get very cold. I want to run this theory by you. And uh, I, re- I want to see where it, I'm just going to say it all. And you can tell me how, how this lands. Mm-hmm. I think there is an argument that Bucky is a pretty good stand in for what it means to be a decent white person in America today. Here's what I mean. Bucky, like white America collectively, has unforgivable sins in the past, right? He did not choose to make them any more than living white Americans chose the ones in our collective past. But as Maeve talked about on StoryCast, that does not mean they are not our responsibility in terms of making amends. And that is clearly how Bucky feels, right? He is owning his past, but he has stopped trying to make himself feel better about it, or at least less bad about it. He's also not trying to undo it because he cannot undo those past sins, at least when it comes to people like Yori. And so going forward to the best of his ability, Bucky is just seeking a good way to be of aid to the people and communities in his life. He's not trying to step forward and immediately lead without merit or pull any white knight shit. He's just supportive and part of a group. And he's also accepting of boundaries because the way he accepts that he and Yori will never be close again It's basically like there's no cookies for doing the work, right? Mm -hmm. Is this a decent read or a terrible one? Feel free to roast me here. (laughs) Um, Well, I always feel free to roast you, Mark. Yeah, good, good, good. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, I mean, I kind of want to build on what you said from your last response to the previous question about this being the start for Bucky. Like, he has more work to do. When Bucky starts a campaign for reparations, then I will acknowledge him as being a stand-in for what it means to be a decent white person in America. Because (laughs) there is more work for Bucky to do if that's what he represents. He needs to figure out a way to make his victims, or more likely the families of his victims. Right. Unless there's a zombie technology, which we don't know about. We don't need to get into whether that would be morally justified. Right, but he needs to figure out a way to make those folks whole again. Like, the apologies and the closure, they're not enough. He needs to ask Dr. Rayner for that book back so he could raise funds and distribute them to all of his victims. A sorry and meaning well isn't enough. <laughs> right. And listen, um, I, you and I have a mutual friend named Kate, And Mm -hmm. the day the Chauvin trial came down, out of the blue, she just Venmoed me $15. And I was like, I will take those reparations. Mm -hmm. I will take that because she understands that moments like this, like all well-meaning white people might feel a certain way, but it's not going to be at the decibel level of what black folks might be feeling. And like to acknowledge that, it's like, listen, I have $15. I'm going to give this to you so that you could buy yourself a glass of wine or like a book that's going to make you feel good or something like that. Because like it's about equity. You need to get to a place where I am, where like this type of reaction, we're on the same level, right? Like reparations are a great thing, folks, and they can be small. You know, but like trying to make folks whole and trying to get them to a place of equity where like the sins of the past are acknowledged and their impact on present day is acknowledged and trying to get victims and their descendants to a point where like they can overcome the sins that were committed upon them. That's important. That needs to be part of the conversation Bucky needs to pay some reparations. I love that. And to your point, he's happy at the end of the show, not because he's completed the journey, but because he's made peace with the fact that he's starting a long process that will probably never end. It will always be a part of his life, whatever moniker he takes on. So I have a question for you, Mark. Okay. When you, at the very end, when Bucky is looking into the restaurant, did it seem like Yori was waiting for him still? Because I would swear, and I know that this is this would be an odd thought, but I was wondering why there were two bowls of edamame in front of Yori. I was wondering if he was waiting still 
for Bucky to show up, which I would think is an incredible demonstration of grace, maybe way more than actually natural. And maybe this is me putting my overthinking hat on and being like, oh, what are all these bowls? You know, maybe that's what the waitress does. And like edamame is there for everybody. Like, I don't know, warm nuts at a bar. But I kind of had this moment where I was wondering if Yori was in fact waiting for Bucky to show up. That would be a weird beat for this show to end that relationship on. So I'll try to put you at ease on this because I didn't read it that way at all. Bucky was standing in a bit for Yori's son. The relationship that Yori had with Bucky was one that was a bit of a replacement for his son. Mm. And I, I took the impression that they would go to lunch regularly together, he and his son perhaps. And Bucky was taking the place of that ritual. Instead, Yori does that on his own. And maybe he still orders two bowls like he of edamame like he would if his son was there. But this time he's moving forward without trying to put in a, a stand in and certainly not the guy who turns out to have been the cause of that right. pain and frustration. So I took that as Yori processing the loss of his son, the absence of the second person there as an important step in his journey. Bucky acknowledging that through the window that he cannot be a part of that. And that doesn't feel good, but that also is something that he he doesn't try to fix to make himself feel better. So that's how I took that scene. But of course, it's art and everybody should take that scene yeah. in whatever way they want. So the white person who does not stand in for what it means to be a decent white American (laughs) is John Walker. (laughs) However, John did seem genuinely moved by Sam's speech to the GRC reps. Did John Walker learn anything, Christine, or was that a fleeting moment of clarity that won't last? Who knows with that guy? I mean, the lines that seem to resonate with him, you know, where he had like a visual reaction to them was um sam basically equating the grc peacekeepers with terrorists and sam mentioning that he's a black man wearing the stars and stripes and he's going to get hate for it with the first basically walker is picking up his head because he heard his name walker was a grc peacekeeper He was a goddamn terrorist to displace people and their supporters. He used fear and intimidation and brute strength as he did that job. So hopefully he's realizing the error of his ways in that moment and it sticks. As for the second, I have no idea how that impacted Walker. You know, (laughs) maybe because of his upbringing and the people he surrounded himself with, he understands a bit of what Sam is trying to say and maybe hopefully is a little embarrassed when he thinks back to the way he repeatedly introduced himself as Captain America to everyone he met like it was no big deal but it was kind of a big deal but was still relatively nothing for him to do because his privilege shields him from all of the extra shit Sam is dealing with now on account of his race. Can I just say that it's hilarious to me that Walker finally finds his humanity and decides to focus on saving people only when it is literally the wealthiest and most powerful people in the world at risk. Correct! Refugees and folks displaced by the blip? Fuck them, right? But the people whose haircuts and suits are so nice that other elites are probably fucking jealous of them? Mm -hmm. He will drop everything to save them in that police van. He didn't care if he lost his shield with his Medal of Honor on it. Toss that down. Oh, hey, here's a nice Lincoln quote about how great I am now. What a clown. What a fucking clown. Yeah. So that's my sort of feeling about where Walker is. Maybe he found some humanity, but not necessarily in the right direction. And I think... He had a fleeting moment of sensitivity during Sam's speech, but we also know how easy it is for guys like Walker to slip back into that comfort zone to make themselves feel better. So I'm not optimistic about his growth. In fact, right, despite every goddamn thing he got wrong in this show, he has failed up, Christine, to a new job, a new uniform, and probably, based on what we know about the Contessa or the impression she gives us, more money than he's ever seen in his entire life, all with minimal reflection and no real consequences. How real is that shit? 
That shit is so real, his next job will likely be president of the United States. I was thinking senator, but you're right. He could probably just skip that. Because I was like, if, if Kentucky will reelect Mitch McConnell, they'll definitely elect John Walker. I mean, just look at the last two Republican presidents. That's all I yeah. have to say. <laughs> yeah. Just look at them. The next time we see John Walker, will he be a good guy or a bad guy or a pain in the ass? I think he's going to be a struggling good guy who is a pain in the ass, just yeah. like he was in the finale. So you could see that he still has some ticks and struggles with compulsion <laughs> after the serum, which is why he wielded, wielded, welded, welded, which is, which is why he welded his metals on the inside of his shield, you know, to have a visual focal point to help remind him of his purpose and his valor and to calm him the fuck down yeah. and make the right decisions in the heat of battle, as Lamar would say. But he's still a fucking pain in the ass. Like, how dare he drop that Lincoln quote about mercy bearing richer fruit. Still mad about it. Than strict justice just days after applying his own fucking strict justice by bludgeoning someone to death in a public square for a crime he didn't commit fuck john walker and fuck this quick ass redemption bullshit they gave him in the finale well i don't think they did for the record i think that they want us to feel the way that that we're talking about that quote Good. his self-satisfied quote to me read as him over congratulating himself for doing one good thing one time oh and the face that doesn't mean that people will pick up on that and that's just that's just tv and maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm giving them too much credit but that was sort of how I took some of that. We'll see. But I also agree. He's going to be a pain in the ass. He's going to get in the way of a hero stopping a problem. And it is wild. I hadn't thought about his medal as like his center point. It's his, the sun's getting real low, big guy. Exactly. Is that like a medal? Yeah, it's his lullaby. <laughs> That's incredible. He needs it. I mean, you could see like he is struggling with that serum. That serum did something to him that he's, he's twitchy. He's very twitchy. And I'm glad that he kind of realized that, you know, he needs something to help calm him down because he lost Lamar. Lamar was that Lamar, like I said, was the saucer to Walker's boiling ass teacup. Like he needs something to soothe him to make sure he doesn't fuck up royally. All right. It's Sharon Carter time. People seemed a little disappointed, I guess, on the main that, you know, to quote a certain other Marvel TV show, it was Sharon C. all along. But like, they literally called the episode where she showed up Power Broker. Mm -hmm. And we talked about her possibility as Power Broker multiple times. Are you disappointed with the reveal or the way they revealed, either one, that Sharon Carter is basically the Power Broker? I mean, it didn't feel like a reveal. Right. You know, like they should have made the clues a little harder <laughs> to suss out. They yeah. were a little heavy handed with it. There's still a question out there about whether the end of the line stops with her. Technically, what Carly said was the power broker would be really disappointed or whatever. Not necessarily saying you are the power broker. We didn't technically get that reveal. Part of what I wonder about that, though, is because of a very simple other question, which is a lot of people think she's a scroll. Do you? So listen, you know from our WandaVision conversations mm. that I love picking out secret scrolls. I think it's a fun theory, you know? She does use that face technology that Nat used in Winter Soldier, so that might be a little foreshadowing that Sharon's face isn't her own. And we had a close-up of her, like, ban um, you know applying pressure to her wound with bandages, but we don't see the color of the blood coming out. So I feel like this theory might be really popular because folks don't want to admit there were some bits of bad writing going on here. Oh, interesting. Because <laughs> like, why would Sharon, the power broker, take the boys to see Nagel, her scientist? She knows what Zemo is about, you know? And then after saving Sam and Bucky multiple times in Madripoor, why send out Batrock to New York City when you know he wants to kill Sam? So I think folks want to say she's a scroll to cover some of these inconsistencies when the simplest answer is that the writers fucked up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and besides, I would think a scroll would want 
power in order to make Earth hospitable for more scrolls. The post credit scene for me just confirms that she's in it for the money, not power. Those are two very different things. Well, you'll be unsurprised to hear that I'm on Team Scroll. I do actually think that's where they're going, just because we know that Secret Invasion is coming and yes. there are there's going to be a need to suggest that a subset of bad guy scrolls are have successfully infiltrated stuff. And so her final lines about we're going to have weapons, access, everything we need, to me, signals the start of something. It could be for something else, to your point, if she's just regular Sharon Carter. But I think there's more here. And I want to get into this more with Jesse. So I don't I don't have to, like, belabor the point. I just want to just say one thing, though, about that is that she's lining up buyers. She's not lining up, like, more people to infiltrate. She's lining up people to make a profit. She wants to sell the access that she's got. And to me, that just doesn't seem scrolly. But anyway, I, I leave it to you and, and Jesse to, to hammer out. All right, I'll factor that in uh, when we bring up this conversation. But even if she's a scroll or not, it doesn't really matter because inside of this show, the evaluation of her arc has to be separate from any scrollness, right? Because mm -hmm. that's not a part of this story. And I think Sharon's arc has some power to it when compared against the nationalist zeal and perspective of Walker, the populist zeal and perspective of Carly, and then the contemplative democratic patriotism of Sam. I see her as an example of what happens when aggrievement, meaning personal aggrievement, like even justified personal aggrievement, turns you more towards nihilism, which is a separate path from those others. What do you think? I mean, to me, I think Sharon represents disillusioned Pollyannas everywhere, right? Like when your whole life has been about serving and having faith in institutions and a flag and the things you believed in your whole life turned their back on you for doing the right thing, like that fall is hard. You know, she believed in something bigger than herself, like Carly, like Bucky and like Sam and Walker too. But when that something turned on her, I don't think she turned necessarily to nihilism. I think she turned to herself. So nihilism is about rejecting all principles like religious, moral, whatever, in the belief that life is meaningless. I think Sharon realized that faith in institutions is meaningless. So now she's all about number one. She's all about herself. She's all about what she can gain. I think that's a really interesting read. And still an interesting juxtaposition with Carly, who I want to mm -hmm. ask you about. Sam spoke pretty movingly, obviously, about how calling Carly a terrorist is reductive, causes more problems. What do you think people who live in the MCU should take away in a good way from what Carly was preaching? One world, one people. You know, I feel like she summed it up pretty neatly herself. At the end of the day, even though she used violent means to call attention to her cause, in her own misguided way, Carly was preaching about respecting the humanity in each of us. Borders are arbitrary. Yeah. Nationalities are arbitrary. What's important is that we're all clothed, fed, sheltered, and we could each be citizens of the planet, free to move and live as we please. I think at the end of the day, Carly was simply preaching for dignity. And I really hope that that's something that folks in the MCU can pick up. All right, it's time to talk about my man Zemo. We didn't get a lot of movement. He's basically sitting on a bed, no cool dance moves, no, no, nothing fun, no cool outfits. He's just in the inmate shit. Though his butler, still out there, doing work. Zemo destroyed the super soldier serum earlier in the show. And this episode, as I mentioned, his butler killed all of the flag smashers. Bucky and John might be the only two people with super soldier serum left in the world. Assuming that Sam and Bucky take the first two places at this podium, did Zemo win the bronze in terms of getting what he wanted in this series? 
Child, Zemo is the big winner of this Ooh, season. Okay, you're giving Zemo him the gold. I just want to be clear. You're giving him the gold. The gold. Wow. Zemo takes the gold. First of all, he got to leave that boring ass German prison that was beneath him. Oh my. Okay, locked up with common criminals. Can you imagine? How dare they not recognize his criminal genius? That's like putting fucking Lex Luthor. And like just regular lockup at your local precinct. Like you don't do that shit. Okay. Sure. Then he got to prance around Europe and Asia with his private jet and butler and two very handsome Americans. He got to drink scotch and cherry blossom tea and drink Turkish delight and almost complete his life's mission. Almost. Okay. Yeah. His man on the outside proved to be very effective. And now he's at the raft where his criminal genius is acknowledged. Zemo had a great season. Bucky takes second for having so many breakthroughs and gaining a family. And Sam takes third because being a black Captain America is not a fucking prize, (laughs) y'all. That shit is work. So good luck to you, Mr. Sam Wilson. Okay. For Zemo, though, I hear what you're saying, and I think we've talked before on Character Cast about what happens when you put a bunch of supervillains together, maybe not always great stuff. So Zemo not only could have gotten everything you described, but now that he did get the prison glow up, he can maybe find a couple other allies to help him do evil shit. So yeah, I think you've turned me around. Zemo gets the gold because the other thing is, they never actually fundamentally pushed back against his super soldier theories. Right. If anything, I would argue that Sam's arc reinforces the value of not being a super soldier when taking on the role of protection and enforcement. Agreed. Because I think, you know, and we mentioned this with Bucky, like his inclination is to choose violence. You know what I mean? Like when you have that brute strength, you want to use it. Yeah. Right? And Sam, Sam, Sam don't got that. Although, um, I would like to know how he picked up a fucking truck that was dangling off the side of some scaffolding. That I would very much like to know how he managed to do that. I'm assuming the two Red Wings were doing 90% of the work or that something on his jetpack helps whatever, because that did seem a little difficult, even with a cool jetpack. Because even then, it would crush his body into the fucking truck. (laughs) Like, that was just one of those Marvel superhero moments where you're just like, I'm going to set the science aside for now. (laughs) But I'm very curious as to, like, how that could happen. But yes, I, again, I love the fact that Sam represents de-escalation in policing because he doesn't have that brute strength. And when you don't, It's so important to use other tools in order to reach some type of resolution. And he's demonstrating that those are the best resolutions that you can get. So like, even if you have that brute strength, maybe take a beat (laughs) and have a conversation first. Yeah. Yeah. Try to do the thing you would do without it. Make it a last resort, not a first resort. Christine, you got questions for me? No, I asked my questions throughout, so I am good to go, sir. All right, then. Where can people find and follow you? Folks can find and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at KippensK. And you can catch up with me and my co-host Jocelyn with our bi-weekly shenanigans on I'ma Need More Wine. Yeah, that show is a blast. I was able to guest on that recently. It was so much fun. I'ma Need More Wine. More Wine Pod on Twitter. Follow them and you will not regret it. All right, podcast powerhouses, that is our show for today. You can find me on Twitter at Mark, M-A-R-C, Folletti, F like Frank, A-L-E-T-T-I on Twitter. Again, check out StoryCast. Keep an eye out for Ponder Vision on Wednesday. And we are going to do our epic crossover event. We're going to do a bunch of cool interviews in this interim period. So we'll have lots of fun content for you. So tell a friend that we are just getting started here at the Marvelous TV Club. And if you are so inclined... Leave us that five-star Apple review. Like I mentioned on StoryCast, I will read every single one once we get to 100. So make it however weird and funny you want. As long as it's not offensive in the real world, I will read it. Until next time, let's give a shout out to Joaquin Torres. You deserved better, New Falcon. Aww.